thank you all for attending the talk. I don't know if it's late or, or early for you, and that's a challenging situation with the remote. Um, I'll try to do my best. So hopefully I can switch slides now, no, not yet. Okay, so let, let's start with what is stateless and what is stateful. Um, I think it's funny that in, in our industry, we almost never agree on the terminology. There are different um, things that people imply when they say a certain term. And it also gives us um, kind of freedom. So I'll use this freedom to uh, have my own definition of what is stateless versus stateful. I've been working from home for, I don't know, nine months probably or, or eight or something like that. And I realized what I missed the most is kind of being in the office interactive with people and especially the whiteboarding and kind of drawing something and discussing and raising. And so I was longing for that and I decided to, to draw um, some of the uh, slides for this talk. So bear with me um, some scribbling. Um, imagine this is the whiteboard in the hallway. So if we look at um, the typical service, the cloud service from very high altitude, I would say 60,000 foot, but because there are a lot of people from Europe with the metric system, let's say from stratosphere. So looking down and the service uh, has a bunch of users that, that can be humans uh, using their mobile phones or computers, other devices. It can be uh, devices like gaming consoles or IoT devices or like vehicles that do navigation or, or report their telemetry. They connect to this nebulous service through uh, HTTP, gRPC, MQP, whatever protocol you use. And there's always data in the database somewhere. Uh, in database data store doesn't matter. And in between there is this kind of mushy, not well-defined thing where we run our code. That, that's where we live as, as developers. And it, at that, from, from that altitude, what the code does, I would argue, uh, it's state management. And, and, and state is just a fancy word for data. So what a code does, it manages data one way or the other. It receives the requests, it processes them, and in the end, it manages data. That's why I, I'm thinking about the title for this talk as um, affairs of state. That, that's what we're really dealing with when we're writing code. So if you've been around building uh, services for the last I don't know, 15, 20 years, this picture is painfully familiar, right? So that, that it's, it's a three tier or N tier architecture where their front ends, their web servers, uh, servers that terminate uh, SSL connections, they do authentication, authorization, they do DDoS protection. And once they uh, authorize a request that derived, they forward to the, usually to the backend servers. This is where most of the computation happens. Uh, the request gets forwarded to one of the backend servers that talk to the database and the state uh, get of, of that object. I, I, painted it blue, so there's a blue entity. Uh, request arrives in the context of some entity. It can be like a user account, it can be a session, a kind of game session, or the vehicle moving on a specific uh, thing. So uh, in order to process a request, we need to load state data of this particular entity from the database, perform our operation, and then return the result. The, the thing that makes this stateless is that once we return the result, we forget that we ever received a request or ever loaded state for this blue object. So when the next request arrives uh, a minute or second, uh, an hour later, we operate as if we never have seen this object before. So again, we load state, we calculate, we return, another request arrives, uh, we process, load state, process, return the result. So it's a very beautiful, very simple uh, approach. Uh, it, it scales really well because we can just throw these servers. They don't need to uh, do any coordination. They just talk to the backend database and they process the request. But this approach is expensive because you saw that we loaded, in my example, the state three times, even though we could do it once. And the scalability is dis deceptive. Um, in reality, even though we can add servers, the scalability is limited by the backend uh, database. Uh, the more load uh, we throw on it, the slower it becomes, uh, the harder for it to handle. And scaling databases is much harder than scaling the stateless compute. Um, it's also uh, 
kind of slow, right? Because for every request we go do a round trip to a database, so it's latency. And as the load grows, the throughput increases, that latency grows. So we can only be as fast as, as a backend store. I mean, w w whenever uh, things are slow and require more compute, that makes it more expensive because we need to throw more hardware, whether it's database or, or, um, or servers. To solve this problem in the industry, we, we um, added, uh, I can switch slides. Sorry, I'm having trouble switching slides. What's going on? So, um, sorry, um, the solution uh, that the industry adopted was to throw cache layer. Uh, that can be Redis or memcached was popular at some time. So with this approach, when the request arrives to the backend, uh, instead of talking to a, a database or a storage layer, we talk to the cache layer. And the cache loads the state once, and like, I don't know if you can see, we create this blue object in the cache, which will hold this uh, uh, state of this object in memory. So when the second request arrives for the same blue entity, it goes to the cache and doesn't need to go to database anymore. So we save a lot of round trips to the database, we reduce the load on the database. But we also improve performance because now latency is just some uh, network call between uh, two nodes, it doesn't need to go to a much more expensive uh, and slow database. So similarly, we solve the problem or improve it significantly. The pro problem starts when we need to write back. So we updated the entity and now we need to change its state uh, in persistent store. This is fine, we can do that, but what about the state and the cache? The ca how do we update both consistently? Uh, there's this old saying and joke that there are two uh, the hardest problems in distributed systems. It's naming things and cache and validation. So in this case, we are dealing with cache and validation. How do we make this work? So my, my argument, not just mine, but other people, is that this moves us to building stateful systems. So it's roughly uh, this picture, the stateful backend that combines benefits of the backend compute and cache, where um, each of these uh, objects um, in this layer can do both. And if we zoom in, uh, it works like this. I think this authentic, uh, notifications turn off. Um, so we have, uh, say, the request for three different entities, blue, um, red, and green. Instead of um, the, the process and the way I showed before uh, with the cache system, when they arrive to the stateful um, system, they get routed to, uh, to specific nodes selected uh, by the system and assigned to objects in memory that represent those entities. We do load state once, and just like in the cache case, we will load into these objects and then they hold, they become kind of owners of these entities. The difference is when the second set of requests arrive, we just need to route them to the same nodes. So we don't route them to random nodes in the cluster anymore. We, uh, we, we send them to the right place where a state is already in memory. And so we get all the benefits of the cache system, but even better because we don't have to make another call over the network to the cache layer. But we also solve the write problem because uh, this green object, for example, is the only writer for the green entity. It, it can go to the database and write it without interfering with any other um, writer for the same, the same entity. Uh, we can write through, so we, we create the write through cache, but we can also write behind. We can, if, if their application scenario allows, we can even batch writes, we can accumulate them for a minute to then write once a minute. So we have this freedom to do to make the decisions in the context of a specific entity. So that this entity, this object, it knows everything that needs to be done and, and it takes care of all the affairs of this data of, of this entity. So th this approach is what uh, we implemented in our leans. And I work on, on a number of interesting projects in my career, but our leans was the project I worked uh, the longest on. I don't know if you, if you watched, uh, Sleepless in Seattle movie, it's kind of a must watch um, in, in Seattle area. Uh, when you arrive, they just force you to do that. And there is a scene there where Tom Hanks character is asked, so what is so special about your wife? And he responds back with a question, how long is your program? Uh, 
So I could talk about their leans for hours and I've done a number of talks and you can find them online. But for the sake of this um, uh, presentation, I condensed the essence of our leans and just uh, believe it or not, a couple of slides. So what is our leans? It's the framework for building distributed applications. And academically, you can say that Arlene's invented the virtual actor model. Uh, we build on, on, uh, on top of uh, ideas in Erlang and, and push them, uh, some of those approaches to the cloud era. Uh, but personally, I stopped talking about actors years ago because I, I learned that most developers get confused by this term and instead of start using just objects. So the, the key uh, abstraction in Erlene's is grain. Grain is, is this object that I showed you on um, picture uh, on these animations. And so the grain is an object that has a stable logical identity and that stable identity of developer's choice. So as a developer, I can choose to use a email or a phone number or a device ID as a unique identity of a particular object of a, of a type I define. So that's the identity part. Of course, there is state part. Uh, the state can be in memory, uh, can be persisted, can be, usually it's a combination of both. You have some uh, persistent state, but you also can have variables that you just keep in memory for um, optimization or some convenience. And you can also attach behaviors. You always do, um, th these are operations that users can invoke uh, on this object. And they grouped by interfaces uh, and uh, implementation classes. Um, in a non-obvious way, Arlene's brings kind of object-oriented programming back to developers that had to give it up when started building uh, stateless uh, systems where it's all about operation, forgetting it. Arlene's is object-oriented. So you have these objects that you, you can use uh, and, and they stay in memory. So let, let's look um, at it, what it takes to um, use it in code. I mentioned that behaviors are defined by uh, methods and interfaces. And in this case, like for Halo World example, we define uh, an I user interface with a single uh, asynchronous method, say hello. If you're not familiar, tasks are promises um, in, in C Sharp. So that's one requirement that every operation has to be synchronous to kind of prevent people from making typical mistakes of blocking threads and um, building inefficient code. So we define as a method, say hello, that takes a string and it turns a string. When we need to use the grain, um, we first call a factory and uh, to get a reference. We call it grain reference. It's really a proxy to the object. Um, and for that, we need to know the interface I user and the, the stable identity unique ID. In this example, uh, uh, to use a GUID, but it can be a string and whatever you can encode in the string uh, will do. So you can arbitrarily define your, your identity scheme. And so right one, we got the user variable, which is this, this proxy grain reference. We can make a call to its method right away. And that's the most important line in this example. And, and I'll explain why um, shortly. Uh, implementation of a grain is just a normal uh, .NET class that implements an interface. Um, it has the guarantees of single thread execution. Uh, it, there is only one instance of each grain in the cluster um, in general guaranteed by the system. And we can have private variables like a counter in this example, uh, in addition to persistent state if we want to. So in, the, in this picture I showed with the red, green, blue object, grains are those objects that live in the clusters distributed in the server. The, uh, I said that the most important part is, is the second line we'll call uh, await user that say hello. It's most important because we never in explicitly instantiate grains. We never look them up. We never see, is it in memory? We will write code as if it's always there. So we, we can have access to all possible grains in the system and the application at any point. And that's what we call virtual objects or virtual actors. To make this work, uh, the runtime, at least runtime runs on every server in the cluster, it handles um, a life cycle of a grain. So you have persistent state when um, the state is only in the database and storage. And when the first call arrives, like we say, say hello, the system looks if there, if, if there is an object uh, with that identity already somewhere in the cluster. And if there is one, like there is this red object somewhere on, on server two, it just forwards a request to that server for processing. But if it sees that the object isn't anywhere, uh, it instantiates, it picks a server, instantiates this uh, green object, loads its state from the storage, 
goes through some activation initialization uh, process. And then from that point on, the object lives in the cluster and can be used many, many times. And if the system sees that the object hasn't been used for a while um, and then it's configurable time, uh, it kind of passivates it, it removes it from memory, deactivates uh, to free up resources for other objects. So as developers, we see this kind of virtual memory where we can uh, execute the request to any grain we like, but in reality, only a small subset of them are in memory. So it's a stateful system, but it's automatically managed for you and it takes, removes the concerns and solves the problems of uh, managing resources, but also the failure. So if the server two were to die because uh, of some hardware problem, that's, a, that's okay. The moment that server realize that it's gone, grain can be activated on another server and they, they are called to say, hello, we'll succeed, even though now object lives on a completely different physical uh, hardware. Uh, because of this um, a stable um, identi logical identity. So th th that's kind of uh, our leans in, in, in the essence. And like I said, there's a lot more material there. What I wanted to focus um, kind of the second half of, of this presentation is on handling failures. Um, if, you, if you operated a service or a system in production, I'm sure you've learned that handling failures is really the most important part of functionality. It's like inexperienced people, are, they, they're excited to build happy path scenarios, but we as professionals know that the hardest part is to get the remaining 5%, 2% or like 0.1% of functionality to get it right. Um, so let's look at some of the popular approaches for handling failures. Uh, I can switch my slides again, okay. So uh, the, the simplest, most popular uh, approach is to uh, use a request response paradigm. So we have our object uh, in the middle and the request arrives for this object to perform some operation that say invokes calling to other services. For example, we want to acquire like provision, uh, uh, allocate the resource, the kind of virtual machine in the cloud, the game server, and we need to initialize, there are two steps. So we make calls to one ser service to allocate the resource and then we call another service to register it or do whatever. If everything is fine, we return success and everyone is happy. Uh, because we're talking about failure handling, if one of these calls fails, with this approach, we do nothing. We just return failure to the caller. That, that's again, the simplest, the beautiful system because it doesn't assume anything. The object that process request doesn't know, it doesn't need to know what are the rules, whether this call should be retried, when, like how many times. It kind of leaves it to the caller because the caller knows best. It's the most available uh, and performance system because we respond right away. We don't delay the request. The, matter, the, the moment we uh, see the failure, we just tell the caller, we have a problem here, go do something. What, what this picture uh, leaves out though, is how to recover from these partial failures. So if, if so the first call allocated uh, the virtual machine and, and, and the second call uh, was supposed to initialize it, but it failed or, or was supposed to register, we have uh, a chance of leaking this resources this machine, potentially a virtual machine running forever and then current uh, cost and we'll maybe get a bill for the resource we're actually not using. So, so this approach, is simplest and, and, and uh, powerful, but it has its limitations. So we, we, we have to think about this uh, inconsistencies and, and leaks of resources. So th that's kind of the summary uh, of pros and cons. And, and in our industry, there is no like silver bullet scenario for anything. Everything is a trade-off. We have to choose pros and cons uh, for any major technical decisions. The most important part here, we push complexity to the caller and wash our hands. It's not our problem. So the other popular approach is with persistent queues. Uh, in this case, instead of delivering a request directly to the caller, we have a queue and the request gets written to the queue. Now, when the request is uh, successfully written to the queue, now the caller washes its hands and say, hey, I'm done, that's your problem now. You need to execute this request. And the request eventually will arrive uh, to the front of the queue and will get delivered uh, to the processor object that is responsible for processing the request. It can be push and pull, or we, can, we can read from the queue, or we can be pushed, doesn't matter. We get the, um, this request and then we make our calls. Uh, 
and we remove uh, the message from the queue only when we succeeded, when the request uh, was processed successfully, which means if one of these two calls fails, uh, we don't really have to do anything because uh, even if that object can fail, that's not a problem because eventually uh, we will re-receive this request. It will not be removed from the queue if we didn't uh, report that everything is successful. So we'll reprocess and eventually succeed in operation. There are of course problems with this approach as well um, because the queues are shared. Like it's usually difficult to have queues per uh, entity. And if we have this uh, message that's at the head of the queue that we fell into process, it can block other messages from getting processed. Uh, if it blocks it for too long, the, the typical technique is to uh, call it the poison message, put it separately and reprocess. So we, we, we have these benefits of automatic um, retries of uh, execution, uh, but we have to pay with higher complexity with uh, this additional dependency in the queue. Although we have the benefit of decoupling the systems. So when, when the caller um, uh, sends the request and puts it in the queue, the processor doesn't have to run at the time. Um, so again, there are pros and cons. We, we, we separate concerns, but we pay with extra dependency and complexity, and we still haven't solved um, fully the partial failure problem. So the, the third approach um, that initially, like we're working on release, I personally didn't pay much attention. I had this kind of naive thought that cloud was a brave new wall, world and then workflows were kind of old thing, they were slow. Uh, but as we've been working with uh, our partners, uh, they're building applications, I, I, I started seeing this pattern more and more. So how does it work? Uh, in this case, there are green requests that arrives to the processor. But instead of starting processing uh, requests right away, it creates a document with sort of execution plan, the workflow, what steps need to be executed and write it to persistent storage. It, only after that, it confirms to the caller, okay, request accepted, kind of written in the queue and starts execution of, of the workflow. So we make one call at a time uh, and, and we mark success in, in this document of the progress of execution of workflow. So if we make a, uh, another call and fails, that's okay. We know that we, we will not write that it succeeded. So the processing of the workflow will continue later from the point where, where we were, the, the step that failed. We can even fail uh, the processor itself uh, and, and it's still fine because when, when it recovers, when it gets re-instantiated, re reactivated, we'll look at the, the document and see what steps are left and, and continue executing the step uh, the last step and then only after everything succeeded, actually after it reports the success. Because reporting, um, the processing of the request is the last step in the workflow that must succeed because we don't want to fail with that. So workflow approach shares some of the benefits with uh, the queue-based approach. It makes um, handling of partial uh, failures more robust because we don't re-execute the whole request like in the queue case. We, we are more intelligent about what succeeded, what failed. Uh, the other less intuitive difference is workflows can run for, for days and weeks and months. There is no shared queue where we would block because the queue system usually keep messages for maybe hours or days. They usually don't let you keep messages that are blocking them for months, but the workflows totally can do that. Um, that, that those benefits are not free. So to build a system, uh, like for example, in Orleans, to make this all work, you have to go through a number of steps. If you need to create a, uh, a persistent timer, we call them reminders, uh, in case the system fails, that will reactivate the workflow later. When we make calls and we do retries, we need to create uh, timers. We need to make all this um, persistent operations. And when everything succeeds, we need to unregister uh, those uh, timers and reminders. So there, there is complexity involved and, and then complexity is at the application layer. As you build an application, you have to do this. But again, like I said, it's, it's a trade-off. It's, it's the right tool for, for the job. And I've seen uh, this tool being used and this complexity being used by people over and over again. So that means it, it has value. It, it, it's not either or, it's like a combination of tools we use to solve a particular problem. 
So Temporal is a startup I joined literally like seven weeks ago, but I, I knew about them. I knew about technology for quite a while because Temporal is a fork of the open source project, uh, the Cadence that was built at Uber by our co-founders. So what's interesting about Temporal, uh, it takes a radically um, different approach. It says it's a workflow first. So Temporal doesn't bother with request response or queue base. It says, we're not gonna go there. We, we jump right into workflows. Everything is a workflow or, or most business processes can be described as workflows. And that's where um, Temporal is unusual. Um, the other thing is it's, it's code first. You don't define your workflows in kind of XML or, or, or JSON. You write code to define your workflows. And, and that's what it roughly looks like. There are two main abstractions uh, um, in temporal of workflows and activities. Workflow is, is like the business process they, they need to run uh, to completion. And activities are operations that, um, that that workflow can invoke. Uh, because usually you, you deal with external systems with side effects and activities are the, the wrappers for, for those systems that uh, make sure that you can execute those operations correctly and, and you can retry them and you can recover them. So this is a, a Java example, but there's also um, the Go SDK. There are, there are a lot of other languages unofficially supported by um, open source community. Sergey, so we work. will have like two or three minutes more if, if that's okay with you. Yep, okay. So quickly, um, the workflow has the transfer operation. It's a bank uh, the, the transfer between account operation. An account supports deposit and withdrawal as we would expect. Uh, we can ignore most of the ceremony code. The important are the, the bottom two lines here. So we call one account to, to withdraw and an account to, to deposit. And that's all we need to do. And, and you can notice that there is no error handling code in this example. Uh, why is that? Uh, it, it's because uh, Temporal uh, take care, takes care of that. There is also a notion of a starter, and, and that's really the, this bottom line. To start a workflow is say, hey, I want to transfer from this account to that account and uh, kind of the amount to transfer. And the question, of course, uh, is how does it all work behind the scenes, right? So in, in, in temporal world, the request arrives to temporal system, which really a cluster um, behind the scenes that it runs uh, its own stateful cluster. So when the request arrives, temporal takes care of writing this workflow to uh, persistence, it's a workflow system. What is unusual here that instead of executing the request itself, Temporal doesn't run uh, application code at all. Instead, you have application worker process that uses a uh, Temporal SDK and that process connects to the system and asks, give me a task to execute. So Temporal orchestrates execution, but it doesn't execute application code. So it takes the first task from the, the list and the workflow and gives it to workflow, uh, worker process. And that's the worker process who makes calls to the services in my example, like one bank and the other bank. And it reports success and it gets recorded and tracked down by Temporal. So in our example, the call fails, uh, it will not re re report success and that task will be retried by Temporal. Temporal will trigger retries. The worker may fail, and again, another uh, worker can, uh, can pick up this task or this work can restart it and pick up the task. The execution is driven by temporal, but even if you kill temporal cluster and restart it, it's fine, right? Because it, it's, it's a workflow. We, we can continue execution when uh, we recover from uh, these failures. I, I call this uh, approach uh, inversion of execution where temporal doesn't really execute codes, like an inversion of control similar to that. And the workflow is kind of, uh, the, the process, uh, the worker process is very simple. It registered the implementation of the workflow class and the implementation. And, and then this code that's written by the application developer executes. The benefit of this uh, kind of counterintuitive maybe model is that you own your code and you run it in your own process. That means you can always um, debug your code you can fix a bug and deploy a new worker. You don't need to touch a temporal, you don't need to tell anything. You just fix bugs and deploy your own processors, um, the, the workers, and 
keep going. The pros and cons of temporal approach, they're very similar to the previous workflow example. The only uh, major difference is the complexity of implementing workflow systems. It's kind of outsourced to temporal instead of um, being the responsibility of the application developer. So the takeaways I'd like you to, to take from, from this uh, presentation are twofold. Uh, first, my argument would be uh, that I believe stateless is a thing of the past. The, the beauty, the simplicity of the stateful model will stay here for, for decades, but all, uh, the emerging and uh, growing workloads, they're more um, going towards stateful. The kind of interactive entertainment, IoT, all these things that require low latency, high throughput, and then be, uh, need to be less expensive, they all point to stateful. And I would say, uh, because stateful is more efficient, if you want to save the planet, go stateful. I walk you through uh, three uh, popular approaches for error handling or uh, handling of failures in the application. That's not an exhaustive list. There are other things that I didn't tie to, so like data flow systems and, and things like that. But these are, the, from my experience, are the most popular things and, and, the, and the tools for the job that we pick or building uh, cloud services. And, and temporal is, is the uh, kind of radical extreme implementation of the third uh, approach. So I, I hope uh, you can find this information uh, useful or for reconsideration for building new systems. And uh, I think as professionals, we have to think about fairly handlers first. It's amateurs that just look, focus on happy path. We need to focus on what's difficult and, and what may fail, the corner cases. And that's why I wanted to give this talk because in my experience, these considerations are very important. So thank you for your time. This is my Twitter handle. You can always like, contact me, send me your messages even after this, but I guess we'll do Q and A. That was awesome, Sege. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we, um, as you know, guys, we have the uh, channel in the Wolf app. Uh, to post some questions, so go ahead. If you have any questions, then we will, you will be able to unmute and, and answer questions yourself. In the meantime, I do have two questions for you, uh, Sigi. One is related to uh, workflows and the other one is related to Orleans. So the, the first one related to workflows is, is there any serializability aspect to workflows in terms of um, a, a, an entity such as an account that might have concurrent workflows coming in? Is that organizing in a queue that I can, um, so for example, can I declare that I want to organize or serialize uh, workflows impacting a, an entity or, or, does it, or, or all these workflows run concurrently? Uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. So um, th these uh, colored bubbles and in the workflow case, uh, the, the workflows, uh, but they use activities whether you use Orleans or Temporal, it's, it's the same kind of challenge. So you execute some workflow, but then you have a choice what activity it talks to. And you can have an intermediary object that serializes access to a particular resource. Like in Orleans, it would be a grain that is responsible for account. So workflow would talk to the account grain and say, hey, I, I want to do this. And, and that would serialize execution. Um, in Temporal, you would need to encode that in the activity code to give the same guarantees. Brilliant, thank you. And and the question that I had related to Orleans is, how does Orleans deal with a network split? So can I have a, a situation where I have a split brain scenario and I have multiple activations of the grain and how that uh, affects uh, temporal? Um, that's not a great question. So the, the Lens runs its <laughs> own um, cluster membership protocol. So all these nodes, they, they, they ping each other and declare them dead. In the Lens, the, uh, the choice uh, is made towards availability. So the, it's preferable to allow for multiple activations of a particular grain for a short while than to have it's unresponsive uh, altogether. And the idea there is that uh, 
if you really care, if you really want to have a strong guarantee, you can always use storage, you use like lock or lease, and guarantee is only one actually has the right to do. So it kind of pushes it to the application with this preference for availability. Uh, in temporal case, it's a similar thing. Uh, it runs ring pop as, as a membership uh, protocol and, and distributes uh, things across the cluster. Uh, there's a notion of a shard uh, behind the scenes. And there it's also a little bit differently. So you can also get a second uh, um, server that think it owns the shard, but the coordinator kind of gets a lease essentially, or it writes that it now owns the shard and commence the version in storage. So when the old one tries to write an update, it, it figures out that, oh, it lost its ownership essential of the shard and gives up. And because they're all workflows, they can be retried and re-executed uh, easily. Brilliant. Does Perfect. it answer your question? Yeah, or? yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. So uh, I don't know if anyone has a question, just um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question. There's no questions in the, in the, um, in the Q&A section in, in the app so far. And we have one minute more. So if anyone wants to, to do a question, just go in. Um, otherwise, I'll take the opportunity to say we have we have 15 minute break now. Um, and then um, if, you, if you're interested in submitting a, a lightning talk, uh, there is a form in the resources section. Um, these are five minute talks uh, that will be presented tomorrow for 45 minutes before the opening of day two. So. Please, if, if you're interested in this, just go into the resources um, area and submit the form.